Welcome to today's Opportunity DB webinar, Developing World-Class Hospitality Assets in Puerto Rico. Today's webinar is sponsored by Island Paradise Qualified Opportunity Fund. I'm Jimmy Atkinson, the founder of Opportunity DB. Joining me today are Ari Kresh and Ash Ashley Tyson from Island Paradise QOF. Gentlemen, welcome. We're going to get to you momentarily, but first just wanted to kind of run through the format for today's webinar. We're going to go for about 60 minutes. We should wrap up right around 1 p.m. Eastern time, and the webinar is going to be broken into three parts. First, I'm going to have a uh, fireside chat interview with Ari Kresh. Secondly, Ashley is going to walk us through the investment offering. A lot of you may know Ashley uh, as the founder of OZ Pros, but he is also counsel and on the board for Island Paradise QOF, so he's very familiar with this deal, and uh, he's the best presenter they got, so we're going to make sure Ashley gets plenty of face time today. Finally, we're going to save some time at the end for live questions and answers with both Ashley and Ari, so if you have any questions for these two gentlemen, any questions about Puerto Rico or the offer specifically, we do want today's program to be interactive, so please use the Q&A tool in your Zoom toolbar to submit your questions. And we're going to get to those questions uh, toward the end of the hour. We'll hold them all toward the end. I also want to let everybody know that, yes, today's webinar is being recorded. We're going to circulate a recording of this webinar to everybody by later today or, or tomorrow. We'll have that available to everybody. We'll make sure we email everybody who registered for today's event with that recording. Uh, a couple of legal notes before we dive in. I want to let everybody know that um, myself and my team members were so excited about this offering that we do have some ownership in Island Paradise QOF. Uh, I just wanted to disclose that. Um, again, the partners of Kingsbury Media LLC, which holds Opportunity DB, we hold an interest in Island Paradise QOF. Um, and then finally, one more legal disclaimer this presentation is not meant to be legal advice, accounting advice, tax advice, investment advice. Uh, please consult with a professional before making any investment decision. But with that said, Ari, Ashley, welcome to you both. And thank you for joining the webinar today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely, Jimmy. It's a pleasure, as always, to be uh, on with you. And, and I and love being here with Ari. Again, I can't Ashley, we're going we're gonna to get to you in a minute here, okay? Chat. So just, just sit tight, if you will. Uh, I'm going to do this Q&A with, with Ari first. So Ari, we're going to be talking about Puerto Rico today. Um, there are numerous opportunities, investment opportunities on the island of Puerto Rico. There are over 8,700 opportunity zones throughout the country, but several hundred of them are located in Puerto Rico. Nearly the entire island lies within an opportunity zone. I think it's something like 98 or 99% of the island. But Ari, you've been in Puerto Rico for far longer than that. When did you move to Puerto Rico and what attracted you to the island initially? I moved to Puerto Rico, be, you know, there's the people refer to people that uh, came to Puerto Rico before Maria and after Maria. So I'm one of the before Maria guys. And what attracted me to Puerto Rico is nothing short of it's living in paradise. You've got the most incredible weather, you've got the most incredible people and the most incredible opportunities. And even though Maria was a devastating hurricane, um, it brought with it you know, like unprecedented in my lifetime um, opportunities because the Opportunity Zones, uh, I think it's a great program that they've established to uh, resurrect declining um, interest in urban areas um, to uh, attract capital. Puerto Rico was seen as a place that needed the whole island needed to attract people. And when you take a look at some of the places that you can invest money and say, this is an opportunity zone. This is nuts. You know, this is the most beautiful coastline uh, and, and tropical paradise that you can imagine. And then you have all the advantages of an opportunity zone. And then it even, even gets better than that. And, you know, Ashley will be talking about this in greater detail, but it gets better than that, that the local governments are incentivizing people that have capital to invest in the infrastructure here. And then it gets even better than that. The government has gotten all kinds of, um, you know, uh, green lights to uh, the federal government to invest money and in, to do, you know, uh, creating the infrastructure. So my prediction is that in five years from now, people are going to say, 
I went to this webinar. It sounded really interesting. And damn it, why didn't I invest more? Because it's so easy for guys like Ashley and myself, who I'm on the ground. I live here every single day. But it's so easy for us to see the things that so many people, they, it's impossible for them to see unless they come here and they see what's going on. Uh, great. No, it's, it's, it is exciting times on the island for sure. Uh, I want to talk about real estate specifically now, the real estate market. Uh, here on the mainland where I'm located right now, the mainland U.S., um, we've had some turbulent economic conditions, turbulent real estate market, rising interest rates, uh, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of headwinds. What's the current real estate investing environment like in Puerto Rico right now? In my mind, it's spectacular. And the reason that it's spectacular is because there's barriers to entry and all the arenas that you talked about, they don't have a very, um, a, a very evolved uh, financial marketplace here. So borrowing money uh, and, and large sums of money on, a, on, a, on a, a commercial basis is very difficult to do. So if you can access funds, the barrier to entry is, is high, but once you get past that barrier, if you can access private ca uh, capital, it's ridiculous. The returns are unprecedented because the people that rely upon borrowing funds, they don't have those opportunities available to them. And the other, the other major, major component is there's a lot of people out there in the world that think that now that we've entered the age of computers, you can sit back on your computer and you can look for properties and you can be as cool as I am from your living room and wherever it is that you live, which is in Puerto Rico, absolutely not true. You need boots on the ground because a lot of the properties are entangled in complicated legal issues. And believe it or not, the craziest thing, and it's so beautiful on, on a certain level, but the craziest thing that I've encountered here in Puerto Rico over and over is that sellers care who they sell to. They care who they sell to. And, if, and they need to be convinced that the person that they're selling to is gonna be doing good things for Puerto Rico. And this has happened to me over and over. I mean, we have one of our projects that you'll hear a little bit about, the Howayek property was on the, on, on the market for four years before we bought it. And we bought it at an insane price. I mean, it's so ridiculously um, cost-effective and it's right in the middle of Santurce, right on Ponte Leon Avenue. And I went over to the broker, who's the largest broker in, in Puerto Rico, and I say to him, Ryan, I don't understand why this building has sold, has not sold before we purchased it. And he said to me, and I, I couldn't even believe it. He says to me, until you came along, the sellers did not feel comfortable with anybody that came to the table. Now, what does that have to do with anything with any of your investors that are sitting on the line and say, that's crazy talk, but that's the way it is here. Yep. Yeah, it, 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 that's. I think that's good that the uh, the current residents or the current real estate owners care about what happens next with this next phase of development. Uh, so let's talk about a big concern with Puerto Rico, and that is hurricanes. That's a lot of the pushback that I get sometimes, and I'm sure you get as well from investors when you start talking to them about Puerto Rico and development in Puerto Rico, investing in Puerto Rico, they think, boy, Hurricane Maria wiped out a large chunk of that island. They have infrastructure issues. We just had uh, Hurricane I Ian, um, Ian, excuse me, move through and, and cause some more damage. Uh, does the frequency of hurricanes dampen your enthusiasm for investing in Puerto Rico, Ari, or how should investors think about the risk of hurricanes when, when it comes to thinking about writing a check for an investment in Puerto Rico? Well, I can tell you that a lot of investors are fear-driven and they look for reasons not to invest in something. And if you want to make a checklist and you want to say, I'm not going to invest in Puerto Rico because of hurricanes, it's an item. But as far as I'm concerned, the hurricanes are the biggest asset that happens that happened in Puerto Rico. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Maria was a big one and it devastated people's confidence 
in the value of real estate, which created a reset of prices and kind of encouraged properties to change hands. Now, property taxes here in Puerto Rico are very low. So traditionally, it's been very easy for people to hold on to properties for very long periods of time and wait for the better days and get some money. Now, the Maria hurricane really facilitated a lot of turnover and it's good turnover. And it also facilitated interest by the federal government to invest in the infrastructure. If you look at the long-term maps of you know, how Puerto Rico has been affected in the past, you know, in many ways, it's not so significant, but I'll tell you about this last one, Fiona. Fiona impacted many people, but most of those people were in the interior and in the south of the island. Where I am, if you came to Puerto Rico right now, you wouldn't notice one thing different about the way the island looks. In fact, most of the people that required some assistance, which I, which, which our firm was involved in, I know that Robbie was personally involved, all the, all the people in our group were involved in helping the community because part of investing is being part of the community. They want you to be part of the community. They welcome you to be part of the community. And where our focus was is reaching out to the community. We gave out food, we gave out money, we gave out housing uh, to people, which is much appreciated. But the reality is that during Fiona, the need for that was nowhere near what it was for Maria. And does it dampen my enthusiasm? It doesn't because when you know about the inside workings of the investment community, none of those things even have the slightest bit of impact. So for example, you hear these news reports that say, 100% of the island was without electricity. And I say, big deal. We've been ready for all this stuff. Any building that we're involved with has backup power. We have generators. So it doesn't really matter. My office is operating at 100%. My home is operating at 100%. And all the properties that we're involved in are, are operating at 100%. Now, what the most important thing that you have to look at is how does it impact tourism? And Puerto Rico has been on fire. The, 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 numbers, the, the numbers have been insane. And when I say insane, I mean crazy. The prices of hotels here in Puerto Rico exceed anything in the, in the United States. It exceeds New York. It exceeds the most expensive properties. You know, some of these properties go for four, five, six thousand dollars a night. That's how, how much demand there is for these properties. The Airbnbs, go look at it. The prices are, are crazy. Will it always be that way? If the prices were half or a third of what they are right now, you can get an ROI without tax incentives that exceeds anything that you're going to get anywhere in the United States that I've ever been involved in. All right. So you kind of answered our next question potentially. And this is our final question to you before we move into segment two and we turn things over to Ashley, Ari. But curious, any final thoughts you have on Puerto Rico and why do you believe that the opportunities are greater? in Puerto Rico than in the mainland US? Well, for one, because the quality of life over here is different than it has been for investors anywhere in the United States. If you get people, and you know, I've had five years to talk to people to come to Puerto Rico, just ask them what their experience of investing or living in Puerto Rico is like. And a component to almost everybody's interaction with you is how they value the connection that they have with people and how they value the connection that they have with their projects. I know me, I'm terrifically motivated to turn Puerto Rico to its old glory days. In 1950, this place, Santurce, where my office is, was thought of as the Fifth Avenue of the Caribbean. Since then, it's taken a massive decline for a lot of reasons. And the population from 1950 to today went from 200,000 to 67,000. It's 67,000. Now the 67,000 people, there's buildings that are empty that have solid bones that are historical buildings, just much like you, you've seen in cities 
that have been resurrected like Detroit. These old buildings that are historical buildings. Now there's an interest in coming here and the rents are, they're, they're out of sight. You can't get an apartment here for under $2,000 a month. I'm getting, I'm getting, well, I shouldn't say can't get an apartment, but I'm getting $1,500 a month for an apartment that I paid $50,000 for immediately after Maria. How does, how does that happen in the United States? And that, and so my ROI, forget about the appreciation because that apartment's worth more than 200 right now. And that's four years. But just think about the ROI. And that's not what motivates me. What motivates me is to turn Ponce de Leon into its glory days. And one building at a time, investors like us are changing the appearance of the street. And it's just much more fun to walk on it see a new restaurant, see a new building, see new ideas. And that's what gives me joy in what I do. Well, that's great, Ari. And I uh, want to thank you for joining me on this interview segment during our webinar today. And just as a reminder to our webinar attendees today, we frequently have discussions like this on the Opportunity Zones podcast. Ari himself joined me on an episode just a few weeks back. Uh, you can find the Opportunity Zones podcast and subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast listening platform. Just search for Opportunity Zones podcast. And now, Ari and Ashley, let's move into part two of today's webinar. Uh, Ashley, I think we're going to turn this into the Ashley show for the next 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, I want you to tell us what you're working on now. Uh, what is Island Paradise QOF doing on the island? I understand you are finding great value in distressed real estate assets and then redevelop redeveloping those assets into world-class hotels. So why don't you start sharing your screen and tell us a little bit more about what the fund is working on. Yeah, absolutely, Jimmy. Well, thanks. And uh, as always, it's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be participating uh, on an OpDB webinar or uh, pitch day or whatever it is. And true to form, right? Like a couple of times I've done uh, OZ pitch day and I've done it from Puerto Rico when I've been down there working on the projects and uh, looking at, uh, at properties and that kind of thing. So I figured out, you know what? I ought to, I'm going to take off my OZ pros hat today and I'm going to put on my Island Paradise hat. So this is my official Island Paradise hat. And I figured that uh, that I needed to bust it out for this uh, episode. And uh, as we go through this, uh, you know, so once again, thanks, Jimmy. And thanks, Ari, for the <coughs> background on that. I love uh, I love interacting with Ari. He's one of the most fascinating guys that I've ever met. Right. So he built up this, you know, this law firm. He is an attorney like me, he's a reformed attorney. And, um, and he figured out a way to kind of channel it to where he provides more legal services and started doing that from down in Puerto Rico. And, and in so doing fell in love with the island. And I think that you could tell that his love and his, um, you know, his interest in Puerto Rico, namely just that it's, you know, it's paradise on earth and that he loves the people there. He loves the place. And I love just interacting with him, whether it's in person or whether it's uh, on a webinar, I, I can't get enough Ari. So uh, this is kind of the disclaimer, right? That you always have to have when you got a deck. And once again, this is not legal advice uh, or a direct offer to sell securities. If you want the specifics of that, um, jump into the PPM. We'll certainly send you that. Uh, we can uh, go through this deck in more detail. We can get you additional information and that kind of thing to the extent you have questions. But um, you know, uh, make sure that you get that and that you you know you sign the subscription agreement and all that kind of stuff uh, because this is open to accredited investors. So, uh, what's the investment thesis down here? And I think that Jimmy kind of alluded to it when he was talking to Ari. But the key thing is is that you know. It, in, in, and so this is one of the reasons why I am a principal in this deal, right? So why I'm now having my Puerto Rico hat on and I'm able to kind of really talk about this is because I saw the alpha available in Puerto Rico, not just in Puerto Rico, but in the specific assets that Ari and team already had assembled. And then the specific team that they had assembled represents alpha. So as an investor, you understand the concept of chasing alpha. You're looking for value in whatever it is that you're doing, and you're trying to send your investment dollars into that so that that way they can grow, right? That's alpha. 
And and for me, right, like just typical real estate had already become kind of frothy, right? And so a particularly real estate in like really desirable opportunity zones, like a lot of that got gobbled up. You know, I knew about the opportunity zones back in 2018. I wish I would have been putting a bunch of them under contract and that kind of thing. But lo and behold, I didn't. And so now trying to get into the game, you know, you got to go a little bit more tertiary in order to kind of get the same amount of alpha in your deals. Well, not in Puerto Rico and especially not with the Island Paradise team. So one of the things that drew me to Puerto Rico is this concept right here. Right. It's recovering rapidly from Maria. And as Ari alluded to that, Maria was kind of a man. Uh, it was a rough situation, man. And it it, uh, you know, it demolished a lot of properties and did a lot of damage. But the the great thing that I love about Puerto Rico is that the Puerto Ricans saw the silver lining in it. So, number one, they banded together. And from when I've talked to people about that experience that they're like, man, it was like a giant family. And so they banded together, they got through it. And then as they've come out the other side, they've had massive improvements to their infrastructure. They've had massive advancements of, you know, uh, of construction, of development and of uh, foreign investment coming into the island. And so it was, you know, it's, it is that it's the blessing and the curse. It's a silver lining inside of that. And so I think that based upon that and based upon what uh, Puerto Rican Puerto Rico has typically been, which, you know, so a lot of Caribbean islands, they're, uh, you know, literally 95% of their gross domestic product is based upon hospitality. It's based upon tourism. Puerto Rico has not been that way. Puerto Rico focused on building uh, on manufacturing jobs and particularly for the pharmaceutical industry. And so as a result, they attracted a lot of high paying jobs. They had, you know, good education associated with those jobs and they built manufacturing infrastructure as opposed to really ramping up on the, uh, on the tourism side. And so as a result, the tourism upside is significant in Puerto Rico because they still have a, a dearth of hotel rooms compared to the demand that's out there. Um, and you know, this is particularly after COVID I'll get into that on another slide, but, um, you know, I, I, I can't stress it enough that Puerto Rico is uniquely positioned to have a great long-term forecast. The other thing was, is that, so I went down there and it's funny, I went down there for, uh, uh, my anniversary and, uh, I had had, you know, I've had like almost 2000 strategy calls through OZ pros and I'd had a strategy call with a woman. Her name is Catherine Maria. She's actually an investor in into this deal as well. And uh, she, uh, we, I was like, hey, I'm down in Puerto Rico. Let's get together. And uh, it was actually based on that strategy call. She took the strategy call from a boat and she was stepping out onto the beach. And I think she was stepping onto the beach at Calabria. It's white sand, beautiful, clear water. And I was like, ah, oh, man, I got to come to Puerto Rico. And so I was taught to my wife. I was like, hey, let's go down there for our anniversary. So on the last day of our trip, I have coffee with Catherine and she's like, Hey, you got to meet this guy. And, uh, and I'm going to forward on to this, right? Because, uh, well, I guess I've got it somewhere here in the management team stack, but, um, yeah, so you got to meet this guy. He's on the ground here doing deals in Puerto Rico. And, uh, he looks just like you, right? He's six, eight or six, seven. And he played professional basketball in Europe. And I was like, there's no way that there's another guy like that running around in Puerto Rico. Sure enough. Uh, Robbie Crager walks in and he's it, it's that right. And I was like, holy cow, let's uh, let's look at your deals. And so we went to uh, one of the projects that I'm going to show you here. And I completely fell in love. And I was like, hey, man, I was like, I got to get involved in this. I was like, I want to invest. I want to be a part of it. Let's do this. And so that began my Puerto Rican, uh, you know, journey. And the reason why is because when I went on that aggregate island tour with Robbie, I recognized his ability to have effective boots on the ground, right? So not only does he have relationships in place, but through those relationships, he's able to identify and develop undervalued assets. One of those relationships was with Ari. And so I got to meet Ari through Robbie and, uh, and Ari has been an unbelievable force on doing this exactly, identifying, developing undervalued assets. And so that's one of the things that got me comfortable about being a part of this and saying, listen, I'm all in. And then the third thing 
that really, really got me there was these stacks tax incentives that de-risk Puerto Rican hospitality. So inside of Puerto Rico, there is a 40% hospitality tax credit that's available for your acquisition cost, your cost of development and improvement, and then your first year of operational costs. And so effectively, you're getting 40% of the aggregate cost of your project back over a three-year period. And so that helps to significantly juice the returns on these deals because inside of a development deal, particularly in opportunity zones, and I'm sure that if you guys have looked at these, you know, they really struggle the first couple of years because you're building stuff. There's no cash flow in. Well, that's where the tax incentives come to fix that. So while you're ramping up, while you're getting the hospitality aspect going, you've got this uh, this tax incentive that you can dial in. And I've got a slide at the end uh, where I'll kind of run through the specific numbers on that. But that was the third and kind of final thing that iced the cake for me on top of it being an opportunity zone. So you've got an opportunity zone benefit and then you've got the Puerto Rican hospitality tax credit, which made it's like, uh, you know, I was like, wow, unbelievable. So I talked about, um, you know, why it's got a compelling long-term forecast, right? Is it um, in 2019, they shattered a billion dollar mark, right? And this was pre-COVID, right? So coming in and, and these numbers, all of these numbers are pre-COVID numbers. And I want to tell you, I've been down there post-COVID and I was down there, I think I was down there pre-COVID and post-COVID. And the difference of post-COVID is mind-blowing. The amount of people that are going to Puerto Rico as a result of it being a United States territory where at the time, when you were traveling to any of the other Caribbean islands, you had to test going in and test coming back. Because it's a U.S. protectorate, you did not have to do that. You had to have a test going in, but you did not have to test before you came back. You also don't have to have a passport. You can travel there on a driver's license. And so I think that all of those things combined have, uh, have caused you know, this unbelievable spike in hospitality. I think that one of the other things that has contributed to that is this kind of I call it the TikTok phenomenon. You know, everywhere I went on the beach, there were these very pretty ladies that were shooting videos of themselves out there dancing on the beach in Puerto Rico. And you get a couple of those go viral and everybody's like, holy cow, I want to go to Puerto Rico. So I don't know if that's, you know, the whole reason why I think it's kind of a consolidated effect of all of those, but that certainly exacerbates it. And it's caused, you know, the, uh, the, the hospitality demand to spike. And as a result, they are significantly uh, under, uh, you know, staffed under inventoried for hotel rooms. So this is the really significant number for me as an investor looking at this deal is I was like, all right, let's look at the RevPAR and let's look at what the RevPAR is doing. So RevPAR means revenue per available room. And that's effectively what your aggregate room rates divided by the number of room nights that you had available. And so that factors in occupancy and it factors in all of the other things that are there. And so you had a significant increase in that, number one, and it's actually 124% higher than the US mainland average. And that's kind of like the, okay, all right, Puerto Rico's got it and it's got it going on. So, you know, I also mentioned this earlier is that the Island Paradise management team is uniquely able to identify, develop, and operate distressed assets, right? So one of the properties that I want to locate and, or look at, and this is the Cabo Rojo property, and I'm going to show you and I'm going to describe all the, I'm going to hold all my, my details of that until I get to the slide because you got to see the pictures of it, is that, um, you know, it, this was a distressed asset. So, I, I mean, where... I, I've been looking for opportunity zone properties since 2018, and I've specifically been focused on anything that's got any kind of water component to it. And there are very few of them out there. And inside of the 8,700, there's very few of them. Where else can you get a quarter mile of white sand beach that's in an opportunity zone? That's what Robbie had under contract when I went to go meet with him. And the key is, is that he had it under contract from basically Post Maria at Post Maria prices. And so that's the value that I was able to step into and that you'll be able to step into it as investor as well. And they've done deals down there in Puerto Rico. They've got success under the belt. They know the contractors. They know how to get stuff done. They know how to navigate the, uh, you know, the Puerto Rican 
uh, regulatory environment and uh, and other stuff. I'm going to show you some of the other folks on on the team uh, that you know throw in kind of additional uh, you know regulatory and financing talents as well. This is kind of a summary of the projects, right? So we got the Highwek building, we got Manatee, we've got Cabo Rojo, and we've got El Coqui, and we may end up tucking another uh, asset into it, but right now. Uh, the four projects is what we're really focused on. So, you know, we may have one that kind of uh, jives with these, but you're not stepping into a blind pool, right? These are on the deal. You know, these are deals that we, that the fund and the QOZB has actually purchased and that it owns right now. So Hiawek is the area in Santurce, or, or it's a building in the area of Santurce that Ari was talking about, that was 200,000 people in the 1950s, and that now has 63,000 people. This building was empty uh, from basically like, I think like the second floor up. I think it had a restaurant in the main floor, maybe a couple of offices, but it was vacant. And so uh, we were able to come in and put this under contract and to buy it exactly how uh, Ari said, right, because we're ESG focused and we care about what's going on and what's going to happen to this area. And so you can see this in the renderings. You can see it that there is care being delivered in what we're doing here. We're not displacing people. We are looking at the environment. We're looking at the area and we're saying, how can we best best positively impact this area? And how can we do good, uh, you know, by the, the, the folks that are doing and that are living there in the area itself? and then do well for our investors in the process. So uh, it's six hotels or six floors, and it's gonna be a, uh, ultimately end up being a 45 room hotel. And this is once again, that key, right? Look at that rev par and anticipated $308. And that's not us just kind of pulling this out of a hat. So one of the things that, um, you know, my background is, you know, I was a tenant and common sponsor. And while I was at that tenant and common sponsor, we syndicated a number of, uh, you know, assets that we put through our tick program. One of the things that we did and we carved out a niche of doing was actually developing and then ticking out hotels. We actually were, we did the first tick hotel deal and we ticked out the Howard Johnson's in Manhattan. And one of the huge drivers of everything we looked at when we were doing a tick deal on a hotel was this rev par number. The other significant thing was that we wanted to get a star report on the hotel and, and do our due diligence and have somebody who really knew what they were doing to come in and do that. And that's exactly what the management team for Island Paradise did. And that's where these numbers from these slides come from, is from that due diligence report where they came in and said, okay, this is what you got it at. This is what we think it's going to take to get it improved. And this is what we think that the rev par will be for the individual rooms. And so when you look at that and you look at the value that we're able to buy it at and what the ultimate rev par is going to be, right, that's what gets into these unbelievable uh, multiples, right, relative to the back end of this thing. And so I'm going to, you know, typically when you do a pitch, you kind of get to the executive summary first. Man, I'm saving that one for last. So stick here in the webinar because I want to make sure that you see what the anticipated numbers are on this because once again, it's icing on the cake. So that's the, these. This is what Highwick looked like back in the fifties. I mean, look at that. This place was booming, and this is what it's going to look like again, which is going to be really cool. Um, and you know, I I think that I don't know if Crash is you know I don't know if Ari's going to put his law firm as one of the tenants in here, uh, or if this was just a a rendering that was like, hey, we got to put a name on there somewhere. Let's put a name up there. But uh, I kind of love the I love the play. It's kind of like his. Uh, it's kind of like a you know a license plate for him. Uh, this is inside, right, uh, with a restaurant and bar that's going to be there. Um, and I believe that this is uh, a swimming pool that's uh, perhaps going to be on the upstairs, like on the top. But um, I've, I, I need to confirm that with Ari and or uh, with the other designer that's doing it. But, you know, as you could see, I mean, these are not base improvements that we're doing. We're turning these things into high-end boutique hospitality assets. And I think that that's the relevant thing here is that we've got great properties, we've got a great team, and we're putting it into high-end stuff, right? Now, along the way, when we find an opportunity, we're going to jump on that opportunity. And that's what Manatee was. And so this one came on the market and we were able to pick this one up. We had to close quickly on it in order to get the deal that we did, but we were able to buy this thing for $600,000.
And it's right now has six rooms. I think we're going to be able to turn that into 13 slash 14. Um, and we're potentially going to do it in a variety of ways. We've looked at turning and converting these actually into hotel rooms right here. Uh, and then we've also looked at the possibility of acquiring this land. There's also another vacant lot that would be positioned like over here and utilizing that for our substantial improvement aspect and where we're going to ultimately develop it. But because we bought this thing and it was effectively, they were operating it, um, they were trying to turn it into an orphanage. And so accordingly, there's not a whole lot of improvements that need to be done. And so we're actually getting this one up and running as an Airbnb. And I believe that we're going to be into, you know, we're going to have FEMA folks staying in there, uh, you know, in as little as a week or two. And so there's revenue that's coming in and that's going to be coming in off of these very quickly. In addition to the, you know, the tax uh, credit revenue that's going to be coming in as well. Uh, this is one of the assets that was a recent ad that I absolutely love. And I love it for a number of reasons. But um, they're you know, back in, in Puerto Rico. And I think that this is attributable to kind of the number of generational households that live together. There's a need for uh, hotels where people can be discreet. And so this was one of those motels, right? And you can see that it's effectively a place and you drive your car in and you can park your heart, your car inside of a garage, and then it's got rooms attached to it. And so what we've done is we're purchasing this motel. And as you can see, the natural area around it is phenomenal uh, for the views. And to turn this, what was kind of a crazy motel, right? The no-tell motel, if you will, into an, uh, you know, a five star i don't know if it's going to be five star but you know a seriously high end uh boutique jungle retreat and so that's what we're going to be doing with this property so it's going to have a restaurant we've got a big common area that we can turn into the restaurant uh we're going to we've we've got the ability to knock uh windows into the rooms and that's actually uh, a view that's there so that you're going to be able to see the bamboo and all of the other stuff that's on this. So it's located at the top of a mountain right outside the outskirts of San Juan. So it's about a 20 to 25 minute drive from the airport. But when you get up into this area, it's like worlds away. And so it's uh, uniquely positioned to be a jungle retreat. So the other cool thing, and this is the reason, one of the other reasons why I like this property, right, is that you see that we bought it for 1.4 million. And right now it's got 80 rooms, but I think we're probably going to be able to come near to doubling that and or to making those rooms significantly better by effectively just closing in the garages and then putting rooftop uh, terraces on top or just going up another level and then putting rooftop terraces on that. Our architects are working on the specific plans of that right now. And so it's exciting to be a part of that to see like ultimately what's going to happen there. But because of the, you know, number one, you know, you make money when you buy real estate because we got it for such a deal. We're going to be able to really knock it out of the park on this one. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about that one. So this this is the property that Robbie took me to that. I was like, holy cow, you mean to tell me that I've got the opportunity to get in on the ground floor of uh, a, a quarter mile of white sand beach you know, right on the water in an opportunity zone? I'm in. It's Cabo Rojo, right? And so this property is called the Bahia Salinas. And uh, it was historically a place where, like, you know, all kinds of uh, local folks would go to, uh, you know, to get away for vacation. And so if you talk to a, a, a Puerto Rican who's lived there for a while, more than likely they went to the Bahia Salinas at one point in time. So this is what it looked like pre Maria, right? And, uh, you know, certainly what it will look like again. But to, you know, I think it's going to be way better uh, the second time around, but not bad bones from which to start. So that beautiful pool that you just saw, right? That's what it is right now, right? Uh, I've actually got a really fun picture from the last trip we were down there. Somebody was like, hey, dude, go do, go, go dive into the pool. And so I went and did like a, a belly flop picture right in the middle of there. And it didn't, thank goodness, it didn't have a water in it at the time. But 
it's just cool to be a part of something and to see it unfold, to see what it was before. And I can't wait to go back there, shoot another picture. I don't know how I'm going to figure out how to do that. I mean, I maybe have to be underwater at the time, but to be able to shoot the after on it as well. This is from an aerial view of it. And so you can see that on one side, you've got uh, this beautiful bay that's down there uh, in uh, this part of uh, Puerto Rico, which is known as Cabo Rojo. And then on the other side, it's got these salt flats. And those salt flats, when the sun goes down, it's amazing how beautiful they are. Uh, they'll a lot of times pick up this pink. You can kind of see it picking up the pink right there. And so this property is uh, on the way to uh, here. I'll, I'll show you a picture of the lighthouse here in a second right here. So it is on the way to this Cabo Rojo lighthouse. These are the Puerto Rican salt flats that are, uh, you know, on the left as you're driving in. And then this is the Playa Susia, which is one of the most beautiful beaches in Puerto Rico. It's, you know, probably one of the most famous beaches, totally photographed and that kind of thing. You got to drive right by our project in order to get there. And certainly if you don't like the, you know, the, uh, the quarter mile of white sand beach at, you know, that you walk outside of your door, you can get there at a short walk to this place. So these are some of the renderings on what we're going to do on, you know, on possibility on here. And uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it's amazing to see what the architects come up with. I can't wait to see it when it uh, when it's done. So this is a map with, uh, you know, uh, kind of where the properties are. So this is the Highwalk building in San Juan. This is El Coqui. And this is the Manatee Project. And then these are the Cabo Rojo hotels. So it's, um, you know, we've got a, a fairly diverse relative to the geography, but um, uh you know, we're stoked about what we've got relative to the individual assets. This is a management team that I was talking about. <clears throat> so boots on the ground right here. We got Ari, Robbie Krager, David McCall. They are on island all of the time. Uh, and our off island secret weapon is Seth Rosenberg. Uh, he is uh, an RIA and kind of a financial expert out of Phoenix, Arizona. He's uh, he's very heavily involved in kind of the tax mitigation space and that kind of thing. Uh, I guess you could call us two peas in a pod. Uh, we're kind of like Mutt and Jeff when we get together, but it's really fun. And I love interacting with Seth. One of the great things I love about this team, right, though, is that, you know, it's not kumbaya all the time. Right. And Seth will be the first one to say this. He will he if he sees an issue, he's going to jump in there and he's going to be like, hey, guys, this is a problem. We need to deal with it. And I love that about this team, that we can have those conversations, we can figure out solutions to those problems, and we can proceed on and we can make it happen. Because as anybody who's done a real estate development project knows, there's stuff that comes up and you got to have a great team in order to be able to handle that stuff. So I kind of talked about the individuals. Um, yeah, you don't, just ignore this guy right here. Uh, but, you know, I, I love the team and I love what we're building there. And through our relationships with our, you know, with some really powerful partners, uh, we're, we're really confident about our knowledge, both inside of the opportunity zone space, but also inside of the local tax, show, uh, you know, credit space and, you know, with uh, additional resources that are assisting us with developing uh, hospitality assets and, you know, top, top shelf hospitality assets as well. So once again, kind of to summarize, you know, stacked tax incentives de-risk Puerto Rico while significantly enhancing, you know, the long-term return potential. Nearly the whole island of, of Puerto Rico is in an opportunity zone. So we get to stack those tax incentives of Act 60 with it. And, um, and then I'm going to show you, right? So then you've got the opportunity zone benefits. Um, and uh, this is what the, the tax benefits inside of, a, of a, you know, Puerto Rico look like, right? But this was what comes from Act 60. Right. So you could see the difference between a non opportunity zone investment transition to an opportunity zone investment, which is real estate investing nirvana. Right. When you jump from that relative to an equity multiple, what that does to your IRR, particularly because the money comes in the beginning part of the transaction, when you add the Act 60 on it, the multiple jumps through the roof, but it also spikes the IRR because it's coming on the front end of the deal. And so this is what our, you know, our waterfall structure is really simple. We don't get paid until after you get paid, which is a great arrangement for the investors. But this is the, you know, the, 
the, the numbers don't lie. It's kind of like when I was in playing basketball, the ball don't lie, Ashley, the ball don't lie. And we're raising 17 and a half million dollars. We're anticipating a 25% IRR uh, or around that and north of a four X multiple, um, when we're throwing an 8% preferred return, and then you're ultimately going to have zero capital gains and zero depreciation recapture on the backside of this. So Ashley, dude, this is unbelievable. What do I do next? So request access to the deal room and you could go to opportunitydb.com slash paradise in order to get that right. Get in there, go to that website, get access to the deal room, get the deal docs, get the offering documents, the PPM, the subscription agreement, that kind of thing. You're going to, it's going to run you through the process of proving that you're an accredited investor and that kind of thing. Schedule a follow-up call with our team. If you've got any questions like final questions or whatever, if this prompted something for you, get on the horn with uh, myself or Michael or Seth, and we'll run you through the specific questions. But then as well, I'm going to personally invite you to our next event that we're having in Puerto Rico. It's going to be in January, the third week in January. We're finalizing details. But if you go to this and you give us your web, you know, uh, your email address, and then I'm sure that we'll be promoting it out uh, to the list that uh, that participated in this deal, that um, you're you are invited to our on island event. We're going to learn about investing in Puerto Rico. We're going to have experts there are going to be talking about it. And then you will get to go see all of these properties. We're specifically going to have a bus tour that will run by all the properties. And you can see what they're like, where they are in the progress of them. And you can put your feet on the dirt just like I did. And you're going to fall in love. And then the greatest thing about that is that you're going to write off all of your future tax or your, your against your taxes, your future trips to Puerto Rico, because you're going to be checking on your investment. Jimmy, I'm turning it back to you. That was great, Ashley. Thanks for participating with us today. Thanks for being on. We've got about 12 or 13 minutes left to answer some questions. We've got a lot of uh, got a lot of great questions today. So let's uh, let's get to them. Uh, by the way, first of all, I just wanted to repeat that URL one time, one more time. It's opportunitydb.com slash paradise. And you can access the deal room, get the subscription documents. You can schedule a call with the team. And also... We know that some of you were having some trouble viewing the slide deck. It may have been a little bit blurry. We put the slide deck that Ashley just walked through on that page. You can download it right now if you head to that page. So that's that. Uh, first question here comes from Tom. Tom asks, when it comes to tax reporting, does an Opportunity Zone investor, assuming a U.S. resident, need to file both U.S. and Puerto Rico tax returns? How does that work? Yeah. So, um, it's just like, so it's just like when, um, you're investing in a deal that's in a different state than what you live in, you're going to end up having to file a tax return in that specific state because you're going to have income sourced from that particular state. So yes, um, on the income, excuse me, that's coming in, you will be filing a Puerto Rican tax return, but it's going to come to you in a K one. Whether you're investing, and this is something that I forgot to mention, we are uniquely positioned because we can not only accommodate investment into our qualified opportunity fund, but we can also accommodate uh, investment directly into the qualified opportunity zone business. And so whether you're invested in either spot, right, you've got your own fund and you've invested into the QZB, or you've come into our fund, you're able to, you're going to get a K-1 from either one of those entities that's going to have all of the specifics that your accountant will need in order to file it. And if you're investing from your fund, we'll give all of the information that you need to fill out the 8996 as well. Good. Um, Carmen chimed in with, uh, with one thought. Uh, Carmen says, El Coqui, the sound of the Coqui is amazing. I'm actually of Puerto Rican descent, so I'm very excited about the opportunity. Thanks for attending today, Carmen. Uh, we had a couple questions from Pam. And I just want to say hi to Pam. I met Pam a couple of days ago uh, in New York City. Uh, glad you could be here today with us, Pam. But Pam's questions kind of piggybacking off of the last uh, question that you answered, Ashley, you did say K1. So, so her question was, is the investment structured as a partnership? Uh, and her second part of her question is, can we share in the depreciation expense? Absolutely. And man, that's, and I apologize that I did not hit that, right? So uh, we ought to have that as one of the benefits in our slide, you know, and Pam was not a plant to remind me of this, that the, <laughs> you know, the fourth benefit of the opportunity zone legislation is that you get to depreciate and you get to bonus depreciate along the way. So you're able to parry, cast, pass that through up to the extent of your debt. And we're levering this up with USDA debt. And 
uh, which is non-recourse. And, uh, you know, then that uh, the up to the amount of the debt will be able to pass through to our investors, which we will do. So you'll be able to take advantage of that. And then when you sell on the back end, you won't pay any depreciation recapture. So yes, the answer is absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, thanks, Pam. Pam had a second question also, which which is, what is the replacement value of assets and how easy and expensive is it to get flood insurance and insurance for hurricanes? It seems like Puerto Rico gets hit by a lot of Atlantic hurricanes, as she rightly points out. Ari, I'm going to let you kind of step in on this one relative to the insurance because so you've re been replacement on value of the assets yep. and and any thoughts on getting insurance. All right, um, I'll start with replacement value, and that is um, probably high because we're buying these assets. I mean, we're buying the equivalent of 170 rooms at El Coqui for 1.4 million dollars. When you break that down. Um, that's less than $10,000 a room. What would it cost to replace? Probably a lot. Um, can you buy insurance? My own, my own view on insurance is that you need to get a good insurance company because after Maria, I saw that people that thought they had insurance, they didn't have insurance, except the ones that are insured with off-island insurance companies, you know, like, uh, like Chubb or some other, uh, you know, reputable carriers uh, with a large deductible. So in other words, if you do a large deductible, a $50,000, $100,000 deductible, and you have a really strong policy with an overseas uh, uh, carrier, uh, I think you're really, really safe because they won't mess around with you the way Puerto Rican insurance companies do. The premiums are low because you have a high deductible and the administration expenses of of handling claims is eliminated because over here, if you have a $10,000 claim, you've got $20,000 worth of paperwork. So that's what my view is. Um, in terms of our own properties, um, some of our properties, uh, you know, you know, you, you hear about the devastating stories, but you don't hear about all the properties that didn't get hurt during Maria and the properties that didn't get hurt by Fiona, which is the majority of them. So we know building materials, we know how to decrease the likelihood that we will be impacted severely by a hurricane. So don't think that all those news stories apply to everybody because they don't. So um, right now, before we build those uh, hotels where um, insurance is less of an issue, as a matter of fact, we had Fiona uh, pa pass through the, uh, our Cabo Rojo property and it didn't really do anything except for help us assemble some of the debris. So that was pretty good. Um, good. Uh, so, so replacement costs are gonna be high because we're doing high-end uh, things. We're, we're having a low basis. What was the second part of that question? Uh, how difficult is it to get flood insurance and hurricane insurance? How, how difficult and expensive is it? I, I'm, you know, I fancy myself a little bit of uh, an expert on insurance, and I think that a lot of insurance is not available for the squeamish because they're afraid of large deductibles. And I like large deductibles, and you generally get more quality uh, policies for large deductibles, and it's available. All right. Well, let's move on to Tom's question. Um, when remodeling or renovating these older properties, how do you estimate the additional costs? when you have to fix any major hidden defects? I've not come across anything like that because the buildings that we're involved with, they're all rock solid cement structures. We haven't had a single, somebody asked, you know, which of these properties did we buy already? We bought them all. The, the, the entry point for the, all of these properties are, they're, they're very opportunistic. There hasn't been a single defect. There hasn't been a single problem that we have uncovered anywhere. And how difficult is it to deal with? You know, you deal with it. Um, it's it, it just, it's not, it's a non-event. No, that's a good point. Uh, I saw that you answered that question already. Somebody had asked how many of the five assets have already been acquired and they've all already been acquired. So that's that's great news. Uh, let's get, we got a couple of questions here. One from Carmen. Carmen asks, what qualifies you as an accredited creditor? I, th I think you meant accredited investor. And I did link to a definition of that in the chat on Investopedia, but typically it's at least $200,000 a year of annual income, 
$300,000 if you uh, file jointly with a spouse or a million dollars of net worth, not including your primary residence. There's a few other ways to qualify as, a, as an accredited investor. Uh, to encourage you to read that brief article at Investopedia, it kind of clears up all that. Uh, Mike asks, Ashley, Mike wants you to clarify, hey, clarify your statement that an LP passive investor, that travel cost to oversee your investment is tax deductible. Is that right? Yeah. And so I should have probably carved that out. Right. So it's definitely deductible for me <laughs> because I'm actively involved in it. Um, it goes and it's a little bit different relative to passive investors. And you're going to want to specifically talk with your CPA about that because uh, after the tax reform, uh, you may be forced to add that in as basis to your investment as opposed to actively deducting it. But you could certainly, you're, you're certainly going to be able to utilize it. So keep track of it and talk to your CPA. Um, you may not be able to actively deduct it right now, but you're definitely going to get the benefit of it. Okay, that's interesting. So as always, consult with the tax professional. Uh, is there- yeah, and I should probably stop throwing that out. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Anyways, let's move on to the next question. I think we got, uh, let's see, we got two or three more minutes. We got time for a couple more questions here. Is there a market or mechanism for converting the Act 60 and other Puerto Rican tax credits to cash? How does that work? The answer is yes. And it's a, it's a very robust marketplace. And I'm actually going to let Ari kind of take the, you know, the, the, take that one. I should have let him take it from the get go. But um, Ari, yeah, I'm also curious how many cents on the dollar do you typically it's way It's way more complicated than two and three minutes. But the, the, the short answer is yes. And what, what do you typically get? How many cents on the dollar do you get for, for selling those on the marketplace? Uh, credits, tax credits, 90 yeah. cents, 90 cents. It depends how, on how close it is to um, the time that people are filing uh, their tax returns. So it's right before um, you're filing your tax returns, you can get up to 93, 94 cents on the dollar. Wow, that's impressive. So yeah, if it's early April, you're probably looking at 90 cents plus. Yeah. Um, Ohio has a similar program where they, they and, and I've heard similar stories from, from that state as well, where they've got an active marketplace. And depending on what time of year it is, depending on if people are filing or not, you can get uh, quite a bit of cash back for that. Yeah, I don't think credits. that we're going to be timing those, right? But we're going to be selling them as soon as they're available for sale. But it'll be interesting to see the difference, you know, based upon when we actually sell them about how much we get. That's a fascinating thing. Yeah, Nothing like it's, it, it's a very unlike most of the other markets in Puerto Rico. It's a very efficient one, and you know, you when you tell them, I know somebody, my, um, you know, we we have a, a spectacularly strategic uh, neighbor that I brought into, you know, that's right next door to us. They're an expert on tax credits, and they just sold a portfolio. They can't get them fast enough. They just sold seventeen million dollars the other day of tax credits. There's a big demand for that. So the market is strong. Yep. Uh, Carmen asks, uh, can can non-accredited investors invest? I think the answer is no. Um, unfortunately, um, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, that's just their rule on this type of offering uh, designed to protect the investor. If you don't like it, I guess you could take it up with the SEC. Unfortunately, they these guys have to abide by um, the rules that are enforced by our nation's regulators. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think so, that's the so, case. So Jimmy, if you're not a credit investor, just come down and do your own investment. There you go. There's an option too. A uh, question from Harshad asks, will you be refinancing in 2026 so we can pay capital gains taxes? Of course, the deferred gain that you roll over into any qualified opportunity fund uh, gets gets treated as 2026 capital gains, so you would have a liability on April 15th, 2027. What, what's, what's your guys' answer to that? Are you refinancing in 26 and doing a refinance distribution? So there's a couple of things. So the, the, the answer is no. And the reason why is, is that we're getting very, very favorable terms on the USDA financing. And so the that's a construction perm all into one, right? So and because the terms are so favorable and it's got, you know, a 28 year amortization on it, it's, it doesn't make sense to refinance it. Now, also because of the terms of the, the loan, I think that, well, I'm, you know, if we're, if, if we don't, we're going to end up hitting it to where we will have returned an amount equal or greater than your initial, you know, what your tax bill is going to be by the time you go to pay those taxes. And that's my statement on that is even further uh, kind of solidified by, I think, the significant likelihood that the 
uh, the current pending legislation of the Opportunity Zone Enhance. What's it? What's it's the the Opportunity Zone Reform legislation is how I refer to it. Yes. So the Opportunity Zone Reform legislation to where it could potentially extend that time when the taxes are due. We'll have another two years of runway of distributions that I think will more than have gotten you enough money to be able to pay your taxes. The other thing is, is that you're also going to be getting, uh, and we probably need to model this out a little bit, but uh, there's depreciation losses that will also be allocated up to you that, um, that could potentially be carried forward. And then you're also going to get your basis that drops in as of the date when those are due. So if that's December 31st, 2026, now all of a sudden you're gonna have a, a, an increased basis inside of the project. And so any unused depreciation will be available at that point in time that you could use to offset those taxes for that year. So I, I don't think it's gonna be a problem at all. All right, good points there, Ashley. Uh, we are at 101 p.m. Eastern time. We're a little bit over uh, but we do have a few more questions. If you guys want to stick around, we got to we'll, we'll get to we'll see if we can get to a couple more. Is that all right? Sure. Okay, so we'll let's see. Tom and Mike both asked a similar question: uh, Is Puerto Rico conforming to the federal OZ incentive, or are OZ deals taxed? And if they are taxed, what is the rate? So they uh, they passed legislation, their own legislation that basically mirrors the Opportunity Zone legislation. So they can form from a deferral standpoint on capital gains. Now, income off of any Opportunity Zone project is taxed. Mm -hmm. Now, we've no, got no, some- no, no matter which state you're in. Exactly. Right. And so yeah. we've got some specific tax breaks that are associated with Act 60 to where we can deal with some of the local Puerto Rican income taxes relative to that. But yeah, there will be- uh, income taxes for everybody associated with it. And I'm pretty sure that you get a credit in Puerto Rico for if you're paying them in the States. And so uh, we'll be able to assist you with that when it comes to tax filing time so that you're it's it's clear and we'll be able to help your preparers with it. Sounds good. And then we got, let's see, I think we just have one more question here and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Maura asks, I believe 60% of the structures were impacted by Hurricane Maria, so it would seem there is some risk. And yes, this is an opportunistic deal, of course. This person's wondering if you have calculated the costs associated with storm damage as part of the business model. Well, I don't think that that number is anywhere close to the accurate number for the kind of structures that we're investing in. You know, you're talking about um, single family, maybe not the highest quality buildings, you know, that their roofs were, their tin roofs were ripped off and they got replaced with tarps. So that 60% number is included in that. The kind of structures that we're talking about, I mean, literally zero, zero percentage of them have had structural damage and some of them have had, um, you know, um, you know, broken windows and, um, you know, other kinds of damages. But every one of the problems, you know, Puerto Rico has built their structures with solid concrete and rebar mostly. So their bones are really good. Now, they're not impervious to earthquakes, but none of our properties, especially in the north, have been impacted. There have been no impacts uh, in the north. You know, the, the earthquakes happen in the south. So I would say it's statistically insignificant. Um, in my opinion, the, the impact that hurricanes are going to have on this investment, especially in light of insurance. Well, also in the pattern, right? Um, and so both with insurance and then adequate operating reserves, which we're absolutely going to have, I think that we're going to be okay. Fantastic. Uh, well, Gentlemen, Ari, Ashley, thank you so much for being with us today. Want to thank everybody for attending the webinar as well. As I mentioned at the top, we will circulate a recording of the webinar out to everybody. Um, give us a give us a few hours, or maybe tomorrow morning we'll get that out to everybody who registered for today's event. And again, if you want to learn more about this deal, you can download the slide deck that Ashley presented. You can schedule a call with the Island Paradise team, or you can access. Um, request access to the deal room where you can get the subscription documents and ultimately go on to make an investment into the fund, please visit opportunitydb.com slash paradise. 
And that page has everything on it you need to know. That's opportunitydb.com slash paradise. I've also linked to it in the chat. Uh, that's all for today. Ari and Ashley, thanks again for joining today. Thank, Thank you, you, Jimmy. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you all for attending. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you.